which will also be an introduction really to what we'll do tomorrow afternoon in the practical session. Then, then we'll have a, a second lecture by, by David on, on the MJO and, uh, and its impacts on the middle latitudes. And then more on the MJO, so it's MJO day. <laughs> uh, after the break, influence of middle latitude disturbances on the MJO. So we'll be looking at those uh, extra tropical impacts on the MJO also. So Hylin and, and, and Nick Hall will be talking about that. And then in the afternoon, that'll be the, the, the uh, session introduction to Speedy. So you'll be working on the, the, the uh, ICTP laptops. They have everything installed. So uh, Fred was saying that, uh, that you won't have to install anything on your laptops, and, and that'll, be, that'll be straightforward. So just before we begin, I, I just wanted to, to come back to that, that that exercise yesterday where we, we were doing the MJO phase composites of, uh, we did precip, and then I suggested, oh, you could try some reanalysis uh, data like, like uh, stream function, for example, but it didn't work. And the reason it didn't work was I emailed to Mike Bell uh, uh, from our data library group. It's because the two data sets, the, the reanalysis and the indices don't have the same units for time. So we needed to convert the, the uh, reanalysis, which has units of days since a certain day, to Julian days to match up with the, uh, the Bureau of Meteorology's RMM indices. So if you do that, that then it works. And uh, so that's often, if something doesn't work, it could be, could be due to something like that. So if you look here, this is the, the RMM indices. You see uh, here's the time grid. It's in Julian days. And if you look at the reanalysis, uh, here's the time grid. It's in days since 1st of January 1948. So that's why if those things don't match up, then often they'll just be a cryptic message and it won't work. So it's the kind of thing, kind of thing to check. So I, I put that, anyway, I put that uh, example onto, on, onto the wiki page so you can, you can find that as well. Okay? So for today's lecture, what I'm going to do is uh, to introduce the, uh, the S2S project and say something about uh, forecasting, sub-seasonal, sub -seasonal, seasonal forecasting, forecasting on different time ranges. Then the project itself, and then I'll talk about these databases, so the database we're going to be using to tomorrow afternoon. And there's actually a, another sub-seasonal database that, that uh, just came online, and that's the, the sub-X, so I'll, I'll talk a bit about that. And then something about uh, the uh, skill that we have in uh, this, this range of two weeks to a season. So this is all about uh, forecasting, which is really uh, one of the end goals of, of the s 2 s project. And teleconnections is one, one mechanism of, of predictability that, that's very important to uh, give us that, give us that, give us that skill. So, weather and climate forecast uh, timescales. We all know the, the the weather forecasts. Now, I guess one of these. Do you have it? Is there a physical pointer? <laughs> one of these works quite nicely. Oh yeah. Forecast for, for the next the next few days. So uh, uh, really, from the, the, the evolution of the synoptic uh, weather situation, uh, and and this this dates back to around uh, 1910. So we've had over, over a, a century of of uh, work on on uh, dynamical forecasting. So based on in the middle latitudes, uh, middle latitude baroclinic instability. Or there may be uh, instabilities in uh, I know, easterly waves in the tropics could give you something, something similar. And then on the seasonal time scale, so this is about atmospheric initial conditions and uh, being able to simulate the evolution of uh, baroclinic waves, for example, in the middle latitude. On the seasonal time scale, then we have these, these outlooks essentially based on the, the impacts of uh, lower boundary conditions on the atmosphere, so slow. Uh, sea surface temperatures, or maybe soil moisture, uh, maybe some also from the from the top some some stratospheric influence, and so we can say we get maps like this, which are 
uh, in terms of probabilistic forecasts of what's the probability of it being above normal or below normal uh, on average during the season. So we've, we've had that, the dynamic forecasts of, of these uh, ENSO and seasonal forecasts, they, they root back to the mid-1980s. Uh, but, but what about in between range? So where you're going, where, where these leave off after 10 days or so, and, and these ones start, which is more like on a monthly time scale, so from the next month. Can, can we say anything about uh, between this weather and climate, between two weeks and say two, two months ahead, and that's really the intra-seasonal time scale that we're talking about here. So the, the, uh, the, the topic of the workshop is, is, the, is the dynamics in that intermediate range, what we call intra-seasonal, or people these days are often calling sub-seasonal. Uh, in in uh, dynamical meteorology, it's often being called this low-frequency variability, LFV. So from 10 to 100 days, what about that? Uh, can, we, can we make forecasts in that range where... The initial conditions of the atmosphere, uh, the, the noise is, is the, that, that information is lost. Right, you hit this this Lorentz predictability limit uh, around about around about ten days, uh, but you haven't had enough time for lower boundary conditions, the sea surface temperatures, uh, to to uh, impact on on the on the statistics because you're looking at shorter ranges. Can we say anything about that? And for a long time, the, 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 the answer was no, and so it was, it, was, uh, called a, it was called a predictability desert. So there was, there, there, was, there, was no, there was no source of predictability in that range that, that could be harnessed. So the models couldn't, couldn't uh, if, there, if there were sources, that the models couldn't predict them sufficiently well. So in the weather forecast, the main source... Uh, at least in the middle latitudes, is, is baroclinic wave evolution. And on the seasonal time scale, the main source is the impact of lower boundary conditions uh, on, on the atmosphere. But in, in if, what about this intermediate range? Well, what, are, what are the sources of, of predictability there? So this is a, a little schematic of sort of, a, the, some of the same thing that I was just talking about, where this is a, a schematic of forecast skill against against forecast range. And so you see here in the weather time scale, we have very good skill in the first few days. And it then drops off rapidly as that uh, information in the, in the initial conditions is, 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 uh, is lost, the, the skill associated with that. And then in the forecast range, when we're here in the monthly to seasonal, we're, we're averaging. The, the idea here is you need to average over some time period in order to average out that noise, that atmospheric noise, so you'd be left, left with a signal. So that's why a seasonal forecast, it, it's not for a particular day, but you, you, it's for the, the three-month average. It's a three, on average, is it likely to be above or below normal? And then this is showing, so this predictability here coming from sea surface temperature, uh, ENSO is the main, main driver there, main phenomenon. And then what, this one in between, it's shown here as being less uh, from poor to zero. So this, this actually comes from an older slide. It was based on a slide before you know, the S2S days where this is the predictability desert where there isn't anything. But what we think now is, well, actually, this could be at least up here. So that, that, uh, there, there is something in this range. And it's a mix of the, the influences of initial conditions of the atmosphere. So it has some, some uh, aspects of weather, but it also has some aspects of, of climate. So as, as you get into this, where we're looking really at weekly averages here in the 10 to 30 days or, or so, uh, where you, it, it's some aspects of climate, because we're not looking at a single day. We're looking at uh, an average over time, over, over a week or, or two weeks. So there's some aspect of there's some element of, it's like a climate forecast, it's just where we're averaging over a shorter period. At the same time, there's some predictability of initial atmospheric conditions. And this is a, primarily the, the type of uh, atmospheric in, initial conditions there are of the, uh, of the, the Madden-Julian oscillation, which is the, one of the main sources of predictability in that range that, that we know of uh, so far. It's also thought that the stratosphere 
is going to be a, is, is an important source of predictability on this on this uh, time scale. But that that hasn't yet been that, that, that there's much more work being done on on the MJO than than on on the stratosphere in this range. So this this idea in in the in the uh, subseasonal range, people often talk about seamless forecasts that by filling this gap between the, the weather forecasts and the seasonal forecasts, as to as we, we call it sometimes bridging the gap between weather and climate. So it's toward a lot of people are talking about, well, can you really make a forecast that goes seamlessly from um, you know, weather time scales up, up, to, up to climate time scales? And if you do that, uh, how, how, how should that be issued? So you could think of it like this uh, as you go out to week, one week ahead, two week ahead, three week ahead, that maybe what you should do is this averaging window that you need to average over uh, should also depend on the lead time. So out here uh, beyond in, in week three and week four, you might have a, uh, a two week average. So for a seasonal forecast where we're, we're three months ahead, we maybe have a three-month average, and just make this depend on the lead time. So uh, after, uh, in week two, we might have a one-week window, and uh, at uh, four days ahead, a four-day window, two days ahead, two-day window, like, like that. And, and so you, you sort of, you, you go down to weather forecast for an individual day, but then as you look further in the future, you make it less specific so that you're, you're not forecasting for any particular day, but for some little window of time uh, that, that, that's, get, that's getting longer. And uh, that may also be relevant to applications, because as you go further out, people may not need to know, well, what, you know, what, what the conditions on any particular day are, but rather what the conditions are likely to be you know, next week or, or, or on the second fortnight of the month. So this S2S project uh, comes from, it's sort of driven by, in a way, it's, it's driven by application or desires to, to forecast information that can really inform decisions. And so many decisions in, in agriculture, water, water management, disaster risk reduction, health, fall into that time range. And uh, the goal of this, this new project, which is it's a joint project, so more or less the first time that the World Weather and the World Climate Research Programs have come together on a project, to collaborate on a project, to improve forecast and understanding on this scale, and then to promote the uptake uh, by operational centers in the applications community. So that's more or less said here. And so the idea, it, it's saying, well, we're going to, we're going to bring the expertise of these weather and climate communities together to, to uh, work on, on these things. And then toward, really toward uh, in the, the global fr framework, helping the global framework for climate services. So if we can produce uh, information that can help uh, societies uh, manage uh, climate-related risks through, through better early warning in that time scale, then it, then it can help uh, adapting, adapting to climate. So we have, we have two co-chairs, Frederick Vitar and myself, on, on, on this project. And the time range here is between two weeks and the season. That's the, the uh, target, target range where, where the project is, is, uh, is proposing that we'll, we'll, uh, we're going to improve understanding and, and forecast skill. So there's a website. You can go there, s2sprediction.net. Every, all the, the, the project activities are, are listed there. And the way that the, the research has been organized here is in terms of some, some specific topics have been highlighted, and there are actually sub-projects. You can find those on the web page uh, on those. And you can see one of them here is, uh, is the interactions and teleconnections between middle latitudes and tropics. And so uh, Hi and Christina are, are leading this, this sub-project. With this one on the, the MJO, uh, there's one one on monsoons. We we think that in particularly for, for in monsoon climates, there's there's uh, a lot that can be said about uh, this intermediate range because of of uh, the phenomena of active active and break phases of the monsoon, 
also this issue of onset date of the monsoon can we is something that's very important in in, uh, in, uh, in tropical countries and uh, so that one of the targets is well can we can we predict the onset in, in this range more climate service oriented one in Africa extremes of course this is a so the major focus of the project is uh, a focus on extremes so can we can we improve early warning of extremes in, in this time range? And then forecast verification, that, that's, a, that's another important one. So those, those are the, the bars running horizontally. And then this cross-cutting issues are, are in the vertical columns here. So the research issues, uh, teleconnections, predictability, what, what kind of predictability is in the range? What's the role of ocean atmosphere coupling? So in weather forecast, most weather forecast models of have tended to just uh, fix the SST boundary conditions and just persist uh, persist SST uh, anomalies. But as in seasonal forecasting, ocean atmosphere coupling is obviously a key with ENSO. Uh, what about in the in the in this intermediate range? Uh, how does ocean atmosphere is it important as a source of predictability in these ranges? Uh, scale interactions, physical processes in general. Then. A lot of modeling issues because this project is really uh, it's it's about it's about improving forecasts so uh, how should models be initialized in in this range in order to to uh, get the most skill skillful forecasts get the right spread of the ensemble how and how should those ensembles be be generated uh, should you use some lagged ensemble or, or all the forecast members launched on the same day uh, what, what kind of resolution do you need? You need very high resolution. Again, ocean atmosphere coupling, uh, multi-model combination. How, sh how should uh, the forecast be post-processed? Calibration is another one there. And then the needs and applications. Uh, this has been done in, in liaison with a, with a working group from the WWRP, the Societal and Economic Research and Applications. And then underlying all this is the S2S database. <coughs> That's uh, what we'll be talking about more in, in a minute. So here's an idea of, of applications in these different different ranges. So uh, going up here, we're, we're going across time scales uh, from short-term warnings, for short-term forecasts. Then in the sub-seasonal range, uh, threat assessments and guidance, and then seasonal outlook as you go beyond it. So if, you, if we look in this, this blue range here in emergency man, management, it could be sort of pre-stage emergency supplies. Uh, in agriculture, the scheduling of planting and applying fertilizers and, and so on. So there's many, as you go across different timescales, there's, there's, there's many different types of decision that, that, that forecasts can inform. And there's a nice report that has very recently been written about what about a year ago by the, the US National Academy uh, called Next Generation Earth System Prediction and they talk a lot about the application. Hi, were you involved in that report? Yeah, so Hi, Hi was actually one of the, the authors uh, of, of this report. So I put the link at the bottom. So this, this slide is maybe slightly getting ahead uh, but I think I'm going to come back to that one. So the S2S database, this, this, uh, this project is involving the global producing centers of, of uh, uh, sub-seasonal and seasonal forecasts. And they've all been, all of these models, there's 11 of them, here they are, from all these centers, like UKMO, NSEP, Environment Canada, uh, they, they all make operationally forecasts in this range out to a month or two in the sub-seasonal range. And what the project has done is to take their forecasts as well as their re-forecasts, hindcasts made for past years, and archive them all together in a, in, a, in a database, which is officially archived at ECMWF and the Chinese uh, Met Agency. And we now have a copy in, in IRI data library. So the, I think you could say, first and foremost, this project is about a coordination between 
all of these operational centers to make their, make their data available, their forecasts available. And this is what it looks like. Uh, those are the centers again. And this is the time range. So it's this, these are sub-seasonal forecasts. Some of them are shorter, like, like the Environment Canada that goes out to, to 32, 32 days. And some of them are longer, like Bureau of Meteorology out to 60 days. But it's, it's in the range of, of uh, a month or out, out to two months. Various resolutions of models. So this is a, uh, it's a database of opportunity. Whatever people are using, they have put in this database. There hasn't been, uh, uh, the, the models haven't been reconfigured for, for S2S. So there's quite a range of, of uh, resolution. The ECMWF one is, is the highest resolution. Uh, it, it goes a quarter degree out to day 10, and then after day 10, they, they reduce it to half a degree, whereas, say, the Bureau of Meteorology one is on a, on a two-degree grid. Also, the ensemble sizes are different. Uh, sometimes you see large ensemble sizes, like 51 for ECMWF. Well, they're all on the same day, whereas if you look at, say, NSEP, it's at 16. But this is, this is the, you need to see this in, in conjunction with the frequency. So they make those every day. So you can actually take several days uh, lag together to build a larger, a large ensemble size, whereas ECMWF is every Monday and every Thursday, twice, twice weekly. And one issue we have is that these could be issued on different, these weekly ones, before centers used to make those on, issued on different days. But through this project, this has been unified so that now all, four, all centers that issue on a weekly basis are, are issuing on Thursdays. So at least we do have some, some, uh, some, some unification of when the forecasts start, which is useful if you want to make a multi-model combination, have them all at least starting on the same day. So you notice that this is, this is much more often than a seasonal forecast is typically initialized, which is month, once, a, once a month. So it's less often than a weather forecast every day, uh, more like on a weekly time scale. Then the other important part of this is the, is the re-forecasts. In uh, seasonal forecasting, we, we call those hindcasts. Uh, here they, they're called re-forecasts. So the model is run uh, starting uh, for, for past year. So for example, Bureau of Meteorology has a long re-forecast period and it's fixed, whereas ECMWF has a shorter one the past 20 years, but it's called on the fly. So that on the fly means every time they update their model, they run a new set of hindcasts, reforecasts. And how often, is, how often is this done? This is also different. Uh, the ECMWF model, they, they make it on the same days, the, the same dates, that they use twice per week that they make their, their forecasts, whereas some of them, such as uh, Korean Met Agency are just four times a month. And then typically these re-forecast sizes are, are much smaller than the, the, the real-time ones. Most of the models are coupled, ocean atmosphere models, and many of them also have active sea ice. So this is, the sea ice is uh, thought to be an important source of predictability. The, this database is now in the IRI data library, and that's what we're looking at uh, tomorrow afternoon. And I wanted just to introduce you to this, this uh, second uh, sub-seasonal project called SubEx. This is a project of, of NOAA's, where these are North American centers. The Environment Canada is there, but we have other ones uh, like e we, we have uh, ERS, ESRL from Boulder, we have NASA and uh, US Navy, and this is the, the CCSM4, so North American models. This is something akin to the, uh, the NMME project that you might have heard of for, for seasonal forecasts. Has anyone, does, is anyone familiar with NMME? There's one person. So, I mean, this is, since, since you guys work, uh, are not so much into forecasting, uh, you may you may not be familiar with that, but for seasonal forecasts, uh, forecasting this North American multi-model ensemble is is a, is a kind of standard uh, set of seasonal forecasts. And here, what they've done is essentially they've extended this to the, 
the sub-signal range. So it's just like S2S, except that what's nice about this is that the real-time forecasts are also available in real time, whereas in S2S, they actually delay them three weeks behind the real time. So if you want to get the forecast made now today, you would have to wait for three weeks before you could access it through the S2S database. And that's because the, the operational centers often have commercial interests in, in, the, in, in the real time forecast. And the, the S2S project is, is meant to be a research project purely. So it's, we, one can look at uh, you know, forecasts. It's not necessary for research to have the forecast uh, in real time. So you know, in, your, in your exercises in the, in the next two weeks, if you're, you're interested in, in looking in, in, in real time forecasts for forecasts made you know, today, you, you, you can get access to this one, this, this database as well. And uh, that's also in IRI data library. So what we've been learning yesterday uh, carries, for, carries for that one as well. So, yeah. So this here's an example of, of uh, forecast, some forecasts from, from the sub-X. So they have a little viewer here where you can, you can actually look at the, the uh, real-time forecast. So here's up. Initial condition October seventh to tenth, for example. Okay, how about the skill then in this range? This is a a picture from a, a publication of ours a couple of years ago. This is actually before S two S, but what's showing here is the anomaly correlation skill, and so red is sort of 0 0.5, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, and this is looking in the first week. So that's weather forecast ranges, but it's been averaged over a week. We're just looking at the skill of weekly average, and weekly average precip for the boreal summer season, and we just correlate that against CMAP observations over 1992 to 2008 period. And so you can see immediately in week one, there's lots of red. So weather forecasts have some skill, and have lots of skill generally, except in these, these are dry regions and these stratus regions in the desert. But as soon as you go beyond the weather range, you know, so as soon as you, you're beyond day seven, there's a huge drop, you know, especially in the middle latitude. You see this, this huge drop. So you, know, you don't, uh, there's, there's not much information from the atmospheric in, initial conditions through these baroclinic waves, et cetera, once you get beyond about day seven. But you can see there are some features as you go through uh, week two, week three, week four weeks in advance. So, some, there's some features that, that just don't, you know, they don't, they just persist through the range. And so you can imagine that, well, why is that? You know, why, first of all, we thought, oh, well, maybe there must be some bug there, you know, because this looks a bit odd. But then when we start to think about it more, then we realize that this is a source of predictability that, that persists. So it's, it's, it's equally seen in week four than it is in week one. And what's that? Well, it's, it's ENSO. That's the, the, there is some signature even of, uh, of the El Nino in the, in the, on these weekly ranges, on, on these short time ranges. And then if you look here over, over the uh, maritime continent region, you can see that there's a, there's a broader, or, or Indian Ocean, you can see broader skill here uh, that's persisting right through to the, the end of the month. And we looked at that in more detail. And, and what's contributing to that? There's some contrib we, we found there's some contribution from ENSO, but there's an important contribution from the, from the MJO coming in, coming in there. Yeah? Yeah, we don't, we don't have. That, that we, maybe we should make those. It would be a good baseline, right? That's often what people do in, in, in forecasting is to, to compare against a, a simple, simple persistence forecast. You might see some of this down here would be in the persistence forecast too. I don't think much of this would be. So we've looked at some other things, and uh, maybe this one's particularly relevant here. We looked at the, the NAO and the, the PA, PNA uh, indices, and this is averaging over weeks three and week four ahead. So we take the period, the second half of the month, 
uh, from a forecast from day 15 to day 28. And we averaged those two week periods and uh, we compare the, the model's forecast with the with reanalysis, what, what happened in, in reanalysis. And this was done over, done over I think, uh, you know, a fairly short period. It was, I think, uh, 1999 to 2010 or something like that. And uh, what's shown here is the different seasons, and this is the anomaly correlation scale up the side here. So here's 0 0.5, 0 0.4. And you can immediately see that for both, in both cases, uh, you really see the skills much higher in winter, right? When the, those, those teleconnections are most, most active. And what's shown here, there's two different models are shown in the different colors. So the, the, the blue is, is for ECMWF, and the, the red and, and magenta are for, for the NSET model. And so you can see actually that they have quite quite similar skill for, for these for these teleconnection indices. And it's it's actually pretty high. It's uh, over 0 0.5, which is in, in week three and week four, much higher than we were seeing here in uh, we've seen basically here. This is a by the way, this is this is just oh, just for one model, ECMWF model. We're really not seeing anything the preset. But here we are seeing in, in both the NAO and the PNA uh, pretty pretty high skill, so this suggests that there's there's some there, there, there's some uh, skill in the larger scale atmospheric uh, patterns of the teleconnection patterns. So what's also shown here, right, so when it says total, that 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 that's just just taking the uh, those weekly averages straight from straight from the model. If it went to sub-seasonal, what we did was we, we subtracted, in each year, we subtracted the seasonal mean. So that just leaves the amount of this skill as coming from the sub-seasonal range, because we, we saw that you could actually, in the seasonal, seasonal, seasonal phenomena like ENSO can contribute to these. And we found that uh, if you compare, say if we just look here at the, the blue here, there's, there's a massive drop in the NAO as you, as if you subtract the, the seasonal component. So it means that seasonal phenomena, your ENSO, I don't know, maybe involving the strategy, make a big contribution to the NAO skill in this range. But it's much less the case for the PNA pattern. So it looks like the PNA pattern is, is um, has, has uh, not, not much of a, not much of an inter, interannual component. Switching to the MJO, this is something that, that you can do with this S2S data is to, to look at all the different models. And so that's what Frederick Vittar did here. He looked at, well, what is the lead time into the future that you can have an anomaly correlation of uh, 0.6 in the orange or, or 0.5 in, in yellow? And then this is shown for all the models here. And so, of course, ECNWF is the best. <laughs> And uh, it, it, it now has, if you think of the 0.5 correlation that we saw in the PNA and NAO, it now has that uh, bivariate correlation out to 34 days. I mean, this, is, this has increased greatly over, over past years. And this came out, I think, yes, yesterday in Christina's talk as well. Uh, that they, they have, they have a, I'm not sure if you showed that diagram, but they have a, a diagram showing the, the evolution of these scores. And they have really... Uh, Increased a lot in, in the last uh, since they've been doing this. You know, in the last ten years, if you looked uh, ten, twenty years ago, this would have been way down, way down here, I don't know, fourteen days maybe. But if you look at the other models, they're more or less they're more or less similar. Uh, it's it's uh, for the uh, 0.5 correlation out to about out to about uh, three weeks typically in many of the models. So the other models also have. Uh, Quite, quite a bit of quite a bit of skill, if not as good as ECMWF. <coughs> so that's for the the MJO index itself. So, so for those RMM indices that we we're looking at, at yesterday. But what about in what about the teleconnections of uh, in the teleconnection patterns in the models? So what Frederick has plotted here is the uh, Z500 anomalies, 500 millibar. 
500 millibar geopotential height 10 days after an MJO in phase three. So phase three is more or less when the MJO gets to the, the convection, gets to the, the maritime continent. And so you can see in, in analysis, uh, Greenwich is, is, Meridian is down here, so this is the European sector. You can see this positive NAO uh, structure. And of course in Europe, they're very interested in this teleconnection between, between the MJO and uh, the European sector. And you can see in the analysis this very strong positive NAO pattern. If you look in the, the, the models, you can see that it tends to be there. Mostly they get the same sign of this, but it tends to be much weaker than in the, than in the observation. So that's a, that's a topic, of, topic of research. Often they tend to get the, the Pacific uh, limb of this, this PNA type pattern too strongly in the models, you can see the inset model there. So this is something that we can also look at uh, starting this afternoon, in, with, when, sorry, tomorrow afternoon, because the, these RMM indices have been computed for all the models and they're, they're stored in the database. And this is how they do that. So the computation of the MJO index it follows the, the methodology uh, of Gottschalk et al. 2010. And they, they do it. They do it. We did well on that one. Some other things you can do with the database, and we've done this in in previous trainings. Actually, when we had uh, an S2S workshop here at ICTP uh, a couple of years back, we did this kind of thing, where you can identify some kind of uh, some extreme event or high impact weather event, let's say. In, in observations and just look to see, well, how well did the models capture that? And so this is an example of some observed data from this CHIRPS data set we looked at yesterday on a daily basis through the monsoon of uh, 2015 uh, over, over northern India here in the state of Bihar. And you can see there was a heavy, heavy rainfall event here, a wet spell, uh, first sort of active phase of the monsoon in 2015 near the onset, uh, July 6 to 12. So then you can, you can look and see, well, uh, what did that look like in a map? So this is a weekly average precipitation anomalies. And you could see that, so it be ours in here, but this was part, actually part of a large scale structure where you have this dipolar pattern of below normal rainfall over peninsula India, and then above average rainfall going up over the, 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 uh, the, the foothills of the Himalayas the, here. So that's, that's the observations. And then we can look, well, what did the, the ECMWF model uh, forecast? And this is its week one, where we start at the beginning of the week of the, the, the event itself. And you can see that it did a pretty good job of getting this, this dipolar structure, which could be associated with uh, a northward propagating intraseasonal oscillation pulse. It looks like that, because we have this, this dipolar pattern. And then we can say, well, what about if we look at the forecast that was started a week before that on, on June 29? So now this is the, the week two forecast of this. And you can see that's still doing a, a fairly good job. What about if we look a week before that? And so this is the week three range. You can see that, well, if you were interested in Bihar, now you really wouldn't see anything at the local level. But it is capturing this, still capturing this, this uh, large scale uh, dipolar pattern, and even a week before that, that there's still some some evidence of that. Even at the even if at the local level, there wouldn't be much information. So one of the the uh, tasks in in people working on these forecasts is, if you have some there's some information in the large scale, but at the local scale there isn't any information in the forecast. So is there a way to downscale from the large scale patterns? If you have a a, an, a, a good prediction of these you know, PNA, NAO, or, or this intraseasonal oscillation, is there a way that you could, you could uh, you know, statistically downscale a forecast based on those? OK. So that's about uh, what, what I wanted to show you this morning. So in summary, we, we looked at the weather and climate forecast time scales. Uh, and uh, we're saying that S2S is this gray area between 
has some aspect of weather forecasting, but also some of some of climate climate forecasting. Then this uh, new project it was started at the end of uh, 2013 actually, and as a it's a five year project, so it'll be it'll be completing its its five years uh, next year, and we're actually planning to planning proposing to have a second five year phase starting at the end of uh, 2018. It aims to improve the understanding and skill in this this uh, what was called before a predictability desert between two weeks and a season range. And uh, teleconnections, as a subproject on teleconnections, is an important uh, research fo focus. The, uh, and we introduced these, these databases, the S2S, but also the new SubX database. There are 11 models in S2S and seven models in SubX. And uh, real-time forecasts are three weeks behind real-time in S2S, but they're in real time for sub X. And then for the skill, there's, uh, the, we, we saw that these indices all exhibit skill uh, in, in these week three, week four range, uh, days 15 to 28. But we saw there's some serious biases in those MJO teleconnection patterns in, in the extratropical teleconnections. I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thanks.